on behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjoy Roy, and all of us here at Team Bacards, I welcome you to this session of GLF Words Are Bridges. GLF Words Are Bridges celebrates the indomitable spirit, diversity, and richness of languages, Indian and international. In this series, we showcase an original work, the translation of the same, and an insight into the author's unique world. This series enforces our vision to ensure the free flow of knowledge, information, and ideas. We now present the princess and the political agent, El Somi Roy, in conversation with Preeti Gill. The Sahitya Academy award-winning Manipuri author Vinodini's book was recently translated into English as the princess and the political agent by her son Somi Roy, a moving and an evocative novel. It is based on the love story of her aunt, Princess Sana Tombi and Lieutenant Colonel Henry P. Maxwell, the British representative in the subjugated tibeto burman kingdom of Manipur. Woven together with a deep sense of sorrow, empathy, and wit, the tale follows a forbidden love story in the midst of the Anglo-Manipuri War of 1891 and unfolds Manipur's complex relationship with India and the British Raj. In conversation with editor and literary agent Preeti Gill, Roy unfurls a tragic account of love, war, and pride while exploring the many nuances of the translation. El Somi Roy is a writer and the translator of his mother, the Manipuri writer Maharaj Kumari Binodini Devi. The princess and the political agent his translation of Binodini's historical novel came out as a Penguin Modern Classic in 2020. His retelling of Manipuri myths titled, And That Is Why, was published recently as a 2021 Puffet book. Preeti Gill is an independent literary agent who has more than 20 years experience in the publishing industry as a commissioning editor and rights director. Preeti has traveled extensively in the Northeast of India and written on issues of conflict and women. She is the editor of the Peripheral Center, Voices from India's Northeast, as well as Bearing Witness, a report on the impact of conflict on women in Nagaland and Assam. Her writing has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including 1984 in Memory and Imagination. Her documentary, Rambuai, Mizoram's Trouble Years, co-produced with Sonja Hazarika, was released in September 2016. She has edited she Stoops to Kill, an anthology of mother stories by women, as well as insider-outsider, belonging and unbelonging in India's Northeast. Her edited volume of non-fiction writings on Punjab will be published this year. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to welcome our wonderful speakers for today. And now, let's begin our session. The Princess and the Political Agent, El Somi Roy, in conversation with Preeti Gill. Congratulations, Somi, on this really lovely translation of your mother's groundbreaking novel, The Princess and the Political Agent. Um, I have really, really enjoyed reading this wonderful story of, of uh, you know, the love between the two of them. But before we go into the story, tell us a little bit more about your mother. Uh, Maharaj Kumari Binodini and her prolific literary life because she was a translator, she wrote short stories, she did radio plays, screen plays, um, she uh, did uh, also dran dance dramas and song lyrics. There was such a lot that she uh, managed to put together in a really full literary life. Uh, tell us a little more about her and about you growing up with her. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Preeti. It's lovely to be with you again, uh, virtual, uh, in the virtual space. Um, I'm so glad you enjoyed the translation. I, we put a lot of work into it, Penguin uh, and I, uh, because this is a major uh, uh, work by Binodini. She only wrote uh, under one single name, Binodini. Um, and this is the historical novel based on her... Um, um, aunt, uh, Princess Sanatumbi, the uh, daughter, the eldest daughter of the deposed king, deposed by 
his brothers and then by the British. And then she marries and becomes the consort of the British political agent. So my mother's question was, why would a, why would a princess marry her enemy? What was going on over here? So she herself grew up in the palace as the daughter of Maharaja Churachan um, Singh, uh, 1891 to 1941, and his queen, Maharani Dhanamanjuri. She was the fifth of five daughters. They had no sons. And, um, but the couple spared no effort and expense in educating the women, along with the sons from other wives. So she went to school, uh, even though first she was tutored at home by English governesses, as was the practice of the time. And then she went to Shillong and there she became uh, enamored with leftist ideology. Now, this is a princess who becomes something, yes. leftist, okay? So this is not, uh, so she, there was a, a anonymous pamphlet to defame her father called the Red Princess of the East. Uh, because there was a triangulation between the Indian national movement and the British and the king. So um, she was a very unconventional woman, to say the least. And then she had her uh, horizons broadened under the influence of Tagore and Santini Ketan. And she was uh, actually five years older, five or six years older than her classmates. And she already had translated Russian literature by the time mm -hmm. she went to Santini Ketan. She had translated Maxim Gorky's mother, for instance. So she was already uh, exposed to Bangla literature. She was very fond of Kalidas, uh, uh, Sanskrit lit literature, uh, Bibhuti Bhushan, Bandupadhyay, uh, Sarah Chandra was her great love. Tagore, obviously, so, and Western literature. So one of the things that we have to remember that, that she is, that, is that she comes out of Santini Ketan. And as a result, um, she was also a very good sculptor and we mm -hmm. are planning an exhibition of her work as well for her centenary. Um, she, it is kind of easy to pigeonhole Binodini and say, oh, here's a Manipuri writer or a Northeastern Indian writer. Uh, she's actually a, a figure of world literature, I think. And I'm not saying this merely as a son, uh, but I'm here, my work is to uh, preserve and promote her legacy. And so I've come to uh, the realization that here's a woman who loved Virginia Woolf, who used graphic devices in her, uh, in her novel, uh, in The Princess and the Political Agent. Um, she's a modernist writer of world literature. And uh, I don't think Binodini can be understood properly just within the Manipuri context. I think she has to be understood as a national Indian writer who was influenced by the modernist movements that were coming to Santini Ketan at the time. She was the muse of Ram Kinkar, as mm. uh, is famously known. But I think people tend to romanticize that a little bit, perhaps with a little bit of a sexist tinge also, because she was also very fond of Nandalal Bose, for instance. So whatever modernist movements were coming to India at the time uh, would surely have, effect, uh, would have impacted upon her as an artist. And uh, she had her deep uh, knowledge of Manipuri culture, having grown up in the palace, which is the core of Manipur civilization and high culture. So she transcended many boundaries as a person, as a princess, as a writer. Uh, I'm a big fan of Lawrence Turn. I, I thought of Tristan Shandy when I read her, um, the way she was structuring and placing her paragraphs, etc. And then I realized that you know, maybe it's more of a futurist thing if that was the period that she was writing, because if she uses stream of consciousness, for instance. Yeah. So I think she really needs a major evaluation in larger terms than just a Manipuri writer. And therefore, I was so pleased when Penguin uh, thought it uh, a proper to publish The Princess and the Political Agent as a Penguin modern classic. Right. And uh, what was it like uh, 
actually growing up with her because I remember reading here uh, in your introduction somewhere that you say uh, you actually started translating her while you were in school and she used to like your translation. So it's, what was that like growing up with her? It's terrible. It's <laughs> terrible being this, the child of a writer. Because, you know, uh, I think it was F.R. Leavitt or someone who said Jane Austen's grey eyes of a viper. I mean, they always see everything. Writers see everything. They're, they're so perceptive. They're like a very sensitive antenna. When I translate her work, I can see parts of her literature that are from our family law that I did, for instance, things that I said or things my, my dad said. And so everything is fodder for her literary art. It's not easy, you know, yeah. So I got, I, I was very self-conscious what might end up in her work because she was always observing things and she would not hesitate and come to comment about the way you said something, for instance, if it struck her, you know, but as a little child, it was difficult. Um, in college, that's when I started translating her work uh, at her insistence. I started with short stories and screenplays. And then much later, jump forward 20 years, and then I started this novel, which, is, which took me a long time to kind of rev up to it because uh, it, this kind of intimidated me. It's a very complex novel, uh, not just simply of the reputation it has in Manipur as one of the great novels of Manipuri literature, but also the complexity of the novel, both in terms of language and literature and the style. And she is known as a supreme prose stylist of Manipuri literature. So it was fairly intimidating. So do you want to tell us a bit about this whole process of uh, translation, especially, uh, especially, you know, about this book, because it has a lot of unique sort of uh, interesting things, because there are pages which you find in the middle of a chapter, which might be blank. There are ellipses, the use of that. Uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, like you said, stream of consciousness. There are just thoughts flowing uh, often. Uh, how difficult was it uh, to, you know, bring it from the Meite into English? I could, I could talk for hours on this one because I have many grievances to, <laughs> to air about the process of translation. As I was telling you the other time, I said, traditore, 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 translator is the traitor. You know? so right. we, but uh, you bring, on, uh, bring up the last point that you brought up, Maitailon, Manipuri, is a Tibeto-Burman language. Now, there's an aspect of Tibeto-Burman languages, and in particular, uh, Manipuri, as the... Um, official name of Maite Lone is, and that is tenses, the past tense and the present tense. Um, we don't use, we do have past tenses, but in prose, you actually do not use the uh, past tense once you've established the time frame. You don't establish tenses by past and present by syntax, but you actually do it semantically, you know, it's kind of the content and the context of it. Like as my friend Yashavanta, who teaches linguistics was saying, we would say in Manipuri, Ngarang Ma Chatli, which means yesterday he goes, literally, not yesterday, he went. And so, so the time frame uh, is always uh, is, is, a uh, is a problematic thing, but it was fairly easy with the other translations of essays and short stories and radio plays and so on. Um, but for this one, because it jumps in time back and forth between three eras from the present to the past, to the to a historical past, and she she demands that the reader keep track of this time. There's a, a reader response that Binodini requires from the reader. She's, this is not a simple read. It's a very rewarding read, but it's a very complex read. I hope you'll agree with me. Mm -hmm. um, so the jumping back and forth in time meant that I had to work very carefully with my editors at Penguin uh, to make sure that we were using the different tenses to indicate uh, much more than in the original Manipuri, we had to indicate that, uh, the, whether it was the present tense or the past tense, or the past past tense, for instance. So that was one thing about um, uh, the characteristic of the language itself, which is inherent in the language, that is, was a challenge 
an interesting challenge. The ellipses that you point out, the mm. graphic devices that you point out, she, you know, we had a big long argument, uh, Tunika and I, about can you start a sentence with an ellipsis? Ellipses, she says, yes, it should be at the end of a sentence, three dots or three dots in a period. I said, yes, we know that, but how come Vinodhini is starting with nine dots, nine periods in a row? So we, so we had to go into the intent of the writer as, as a literary stylist, and we came to the uh, uh, agreement that this is Vinodhini style and we have to preserve it. Because what we came to realize is that Vinodhini was actually uh, um, controlling the pace of reading as the words are being read off the page. Similarly to the pages that have single lines or two, two line paragraphs or the jumps, we actually exaggerated that in the Penguin edition, lest people think that it was a mistake. Mm. It was bad enough that people in Manipur were saying, mm. oh, there are commas missing and, that's, uh, and full stops missing in the passage. And I'm saying, well, geez, actually, <laughs> you know, it was a big admirer of Virginia Woolf, you know. Um, so, so the graphic devices on the page was another style that we had to keep. But the biggest challenge, I think, was something that I had to wrestle with by myself, and I could not get the help of my wonderful editors at Penguin, and that is Manipuri as a language has three or four different forms that she is using here. We have the common Manipuri, and from the manuscripts in the passages of song, for instance, the ballads that are quoted that Not Guilty sings, it is Aribalon, which is the ancient Manipuri, the old Manipuri, archaic. It's like Chaucer. So it's like Middle English that she was using. And then on top of this, there are honorific languages. There is a lexical archive of honorific words. We do not use the same word for eat or to go or sit with people that you respect. It's not just a matter of adding G or PA or, you know, the, the right. likeness. Yes, you can add the, the please, uh, but there is a different vocabulary. And on top of that, and this is what Manipuris also don't know, especially the young people, is that there's also palace speak. There's a sociolect of royal talk that is confined to the palace and to the princesses. So the way they address each other, the way they talk, my Lord, every character was, uh, uh, the king was addressed in six different ways, depending on who was talking to him in what context. And these are finer points of translation that unfortunately I had to rule it, yeah. kind of iron out because I had to put it into one language, the target language being English. But also on top of this, because of, it's a historical novel, she uses other languages as well, like Bangla, like Sanskrit, like English, like Hindi, and depending on who's speaking it, sometimes it is broken Hindi, broken Manipuri, depending on the character, Maxwell's way of speaking Manipuri is different <clears> from <throat> the way the queen speaks, for instance. You know? So these finer points, I'm afraid had to go, I had to just say like, I'm sorry, this is a translation into English. This, this will have to go uh, because these are peculiarities of, of the Manipuri language, of the different languages, of language of the palace, of that particular group of privileged people, the way to, they're taught how to speak when they come to, a woman who is married by the, by the king is brought to the palace and taught how to speak and taught mm. how to sit and taught how to eat and how to drink. You cannot do anything any old way anymore. So, <clears throat> and then of course the we have, I counted seven different languages that she was using. So it was a it was an interesting challenge, uh, difficult, but I think um, I was happy with the product, and I think Penguin was too. Yeah, and it sounds completely fascinating. Also, I mean, I'm sure it was difficult to wrestle with all these. Uh, problems, so to speak, as they came up, but uh, it is really a fascinating uh, what you've described. Uh, do you want to also read a little bit and show us exactly how you do this? Um, you know, because uh, of the modernist movements, my mother was born in 1922 and she went to college in 1930. 
39. She had to drop out because the war started coming. The Japanese started coming to Burma and was knocking on the doors of Manipur at that time. So, um, so one of the things that interested me was her interest in nonsense poetry, which is, if you think about the ellipses and you, if you think about the way she's playing with time and the disregard for this, at the same time, very rooted in this, it could be part of the whole, um, I know Shantini Ketan had uh, expressionism coming in from, uh, um, from the West, but they were probably waves of futurism also. So if you have to like, you know, if you look at the, their interest in graphic devices, they're interested in working with the page, they're interested in nonsense, for instance. So they like with the futurist manifesto and so on. So, so I think a lot of that needs to be done. So what I want to read is <clears throat> first in Manipuri, this is about a choir of very talented and mm. uh, really talented wastrels mm. from uh, actually Binodini's own neighborhood. This is exactly where I'm sitting right now called the high school, known for not doing anything, but just making fun of people, of dancing, of writing and singing. This is the cultural heart of Manipur, of Impal also. So they made a, a they made up a choir called the Kabul Choir because Afghans used to come to Manipur back in the day uh, as peddlers bringing things to sell. So they made up a choir called the Kabul Choir and they had a song and I remember my grand uncle actually reciting this to my mother and she was doubled up in laughter and, she, and then she included it here. So this is a real song that was composed at, at the, during the time of her father. And so this is the Manipuri version, uh, the Manipuri original. <coughs> Excuse me. No money came to Rachana Sindana Konung the Kabul Pala Kaurega Chang Yang Taure Sanato Bisulak Tuna Yang Lai Isai Haure Lampakta Lupak Kuntra Mukna Ahan Bada Bengul Makoi Makol Ma Mana Nupa Anina Kung Lai Nabon Kaibong Kabo Nai Jang Jang Petre Petri Pinao Nao Nao Jang Jang Napui Jang Adudagi Pung Ani Yeraga Pala Lentula E. Isaitare E. Jang Kela Re Kela He Jangi Alla Bikopana Ro Yo Ya Nar. So this is a, a fake nonsense language with enough references to make it sound, it's a bit like the Jabberwocky or something, you know, like the, uh, Twizz Brilligan, the Slithy Toves, you know, somehow you kind of think it has meaning and, and then you realize it doesn't, right? Uh, yeah, but yet it does. So there are, uh, uh, there are onomatopoeic uh, references, there are this wordplay involved, enough indications to give it a somewhat Afghan Muslim favor, flavor, mm -hmm. um, and also this, to, to make the sounds of bands and their brass instruments and the drums as well. And so I had to translate this uh, to, and also my challenge was to also give enough references to the English language reader to, to see that there is some meaning being conveyed without giving any meaning whatsoever. And so this is uh, my translation of what I just read you. And that is, Little Majesty Churachan arranged for an audition for the Kabul choir at the palace one day. Sanatomi also came to watch. About 30 men started the music on the lawn. At first, two men made sounds like bugles. Nabon Kaibong do nothing. Clang, clang, Petri, Petri. Pinau, Pinau, little, little. Clang, clang, Napui, clang. Then the choir came out accompanied by the beating of two drums and they sang, Jangi is playing, play the Jangi for Allah Panaro, Yo Ya Naro. So, yeah, so I, had, I kept in words like, is playing uh, Allah, uh, you know, the, the bugle stuff, like, Pinau, Pinau, little, mm -hmm. little. I mean, these are things that I have to give enough indication to the reader that this is something that is nonsense at the same time is conveying some sort of meaning at a nonsense level. So that was an interesting challenge. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Thank you for that. Uh, I just want to go back a little bit, you know, to when you first started and told us uh, about your mother. 
and uh, you know using this little bit of personal history of the family and uh, writing this uh, uh, novel uh, because she calls it a novel even though it does have some basis in a real story uh, of her own aunt and of course Maxwell the political agent um but this airing of a family scandal so to speak uh which was uh, supposed to be long buried and uh, you've also written that you only heard about it in song or in in some kind of stories of long ago uh what was uh, the reaction of the family when she wrote it and what was the reaction also of uh, manipuri readers when the novel came out well she's a very strong will person as you can see from her writing um when she was writing the novel that's when the family the palace really didn't want this the question her nicely mm-hmm. are you sure you want to do this they were quite upset about it um because sanatombi the story of sanatombi i heard like many people did in manipur as a dog sanatombi mangle mangle you know it just sometimes that we would recite oh she is lost she is all you know she's messed up you know that kind of thing because she became unclean and she was mm-hmm. ostracized as a result of her actions and her of her life was scandalous which is a huge scandal and so um and because she was rescuing this woman she was known as an immoral woman she was how can she marry an unclean white man the enemy and she's a princess for god's sake i mean like all these complexities so the family actually want to didn't want this uh, you know they need to actually write anything about this and she herself um it was so deeply buried that she thought it was very long ago and she was quite surprised to find that it was within her mother's uh, living memory and her mother's stories about meeting sanatombi are really the basis the foundation of you know the news novel but when the novel came out i mean people have been always you know she was uh, all her work until then had been about ordinary people from all walks of life there was no indication if you read her earlier work there's no indication that she was a person of a very unique and privileged background this one really put it out there in terms of with the inner knowledge of of the mores of the manners the customs the long descriptions of royal jewelry of the kind of clothes they wear the way they speak now these are things that um uh an artist actually brought out very effectively but it was something that most people were curious about and had lost uh knowledge of so that was one thing that came out women adored you know they did young women adored me that day here is a manipuri woman oh like me look at her she can do this and so they claimed her as a feminist uh she did not like careerism in feminism and marxism she had no use for the isms actually uh she said oh i'm not a feminist but there's no doubt that she was embraced by uh, young women you know, who adored her and of course the literary world it was actually taken by storm on this one i'm sure some people had the, the she had the detractors at, at her time but it was a, the a major uh, publishing event and it's still a major book today and the character of uh, sanatombi herself i mean she comes across as really beautiful but self-willed and highly intelligent because she's been consulted uh on on uh, things which are way beyond her age really and uh, and confident but she is a girl child and there is always that difference between her and the other uh the young playmate that she has and who is then you know allowed to sit on the elephant for example while you know she has to dress up as a boy before she can be allowed to do that uh so she grows up in a vast splendid cultivated prison is what it says so do you want to talk about that this uh, sort of disjunct between somebody who's uh, being given a lot of privilege even by her own family and her you know her father and her grandfather but yet she is a girl child well uh, maharani dana manjuri uh, had only daughters so there is a very strong 
parallel between Vinodini's own life and Sanatomi's own life. Um, because uh, Maharani Dhanamanjari was the recognized official queen, it is quite possible that had Binodini been a boy, she would have been king. Mm. Quite like Sanatombi. So you have the grandmother and everyone every now and then telling, even Maxwell tells her, if you had been a boy, I would have recommended you and I would, would have put you on the throne because she was the smartest. But then, so there was, that, there was that undercurrent, which, you know, we don't speak about very much over here, but my mother's royal palace name is Wangol and Sana, and Wangol Ningtho is, is the word for crown prince. So when she was born, she was birthed on a golden mat, and because she was born after her father's Manipuri coronation, Binodini actually had the highest status among all the princesses and princes, including ones older than her. When all the kids were lined up for lunch at the palace or a royal feast, her, her royal seat would be dragged four inches, three or four inches ahead of everyone else. So even though she's a little thing and they had older sisters and brothers and so on, so she had a very privileged thing and the denial which of, of, the, of succession to her, uh, to her mother's uh, was, was, uh, was uh, something that her mother felt very deeply. Varana Dhanamanjari just could not bear the fact that every child she bore was a daughter because the one that was the first son that she bore would, 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 would be on the throne, even to the last one, you know, Dini. That's why she said, I'll make my daughters better than all the sons that the king has. And that was a vow apparently at one time. Um, so there is a lot of parallel in that one. And then Vinodini is also rescuing from certain obscurity, uh, two other women, uh, the uh, queen mother and the, the grand queen mother, the two, the, the Ranis, you know, the Maharanis, both of them. So the training, the political analysis is very acute, it's very sharp. The, why the British were doing this, the impact of the Sepoy mutiny, um, what is Burma going to be doing about this, you know, how does sibling rivalry play into this, why, should, why would someone surrender a prince to the British, for instance, where did things go wrong? The historical analysis, the political analysis of the anglo manipuri War of 1891 that Binodini gets into this book, I thought was extremely sharp. And it is kind of, it reflects the conversation that she obviously had with her father and her, and her mother. And you can find that in her book of memoirs, the palace memoirs called the Maharaja's Household, which Zuban also published, uh, my translation that they published. And so the, um, what you have is basically a woman who is looking at other women and saying, these are two women I admire very much in history, relating it to Sanatombi and Sanatombi's <laughs> own position in the family and in succession in a patriarchy. Uh, because even though Manipur women, women are very powerful, sometimes people say, oh, Manipur is matrilineal or matriarchal. That's not true at all. Manipur is a patriarchy. And so being shut out of the palace, for instance, um, and then becoming a commie, uh, not actually a communist, but certainly swayed by leftist thinking at the time. So, and at the time when the Congress was, was making inroads into Manipur, the Indian national movement was starting to um, have its impact over here. Uh, they were beginning to question the monarchy and the impending democracy that was coming. So there was a lot of political uh, winds that were blowing at the time. Um, so Binodini is interesting because she comes from one world and then she makes a very successful transition into, the, into modernity, quite unlike many other princes and princesses mm -hmm. who just kind of stayed in their privileged uh, social stations. Yeah, well, that's uh, in the novel uh, and in this translation of yours, um, in the story, there are so many strong uh, women characters, you've named some right now, uh, and they are a reflection of the, you know, the strong women of Manipur, because one always hears about that, mm, the women's market, the Ima market, the Mirapaibis, 
uh, you know, the, the Dupilans, who are the three of them, uh, also against the British and earlier. British. Um, uh, the first one was the one that my mother describes in the novel, which mm. is against Maxwell, and where Sanatomy gets right. okay. caught, in, mm. uh, uh, caught in the middle of. And then there was one uh, before the uh, outbreak of the uh, Second World War. For rice, and there was something. Because you know, at the time of the Bengal famine right. and all, okay. they were also taking rice out of Manipur. Um, and so the uh, so there was another uh, protest, uh, uh, women's war led by the women, and the fulcrum of all this, as in the novel, when the British want to say something, they put notices up in the women's market. That's where the political discussion mm. takes place. Mm. That's where radicalization takes place. That's where groups start forming. This, that is where uh, agendas are created. So even today, the women's market is very powerful social institution. Yes, and then of course, uh, you already mentioned the very obvious, uh, you know, patriarchy. So whether it's in the rituals in the palace and the, the or what one sees in Mete society, uh, it is obviously uh, patriarchal. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that, uh, you know, this other symbol of Manipuri pride is uh, the fort, Kangla. And uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that because of course it features here as the place that the British take over and then destroy little bits of it, including the two uh, sort of sentinels that stand there. And, uh, and what that means, you know, like a blow kind of thing too, because it's sort of uh, a breaking down of the, of the civilization of the, of the Metis. And then, uh, also, you know, so much more recently when the Indian security forces uh, took over the fort and then they were ensconced there and then how there was the, the protest uh, by the elderly Imas uh, in front of the fort. So this long history of, of actually this being a symbol of uh, the pride of Manipur. The, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. The uh, Kangla fort in the heart of Impal is the core of Manipur's existence and identity. It's a moated fort, it's actually a double moated fort. Um, and um, we are not a material culture, so there are no big monuments. It's really more about worship and shrines and manuscripts and performance that uh, Manipuri high civilization is based on. But Kangla had these, in the palace, had these two um, mythical beasts, these leogryphs. Um, and um, I was uh, walking in Kangla with my uh, friend, Dr. Tin Mount Chi uh, uh, from uh, Mandalay. And um, he said, oh, look, Chinte. And I said, yeah, they are Chinte because Chinte, Chintes are the guardian uh, mythical beasts outside of every pagoda. And this is a, an icon that comes actually also from south, Southern China. But our Kangla Sa uh, has horns. And that's what the, do the, the elderly doctor immediately said, but you have horns. I said, yes, because these are the, the Manipuris like to put Sangai antlers on headdresses and boats and house decorations and so on. So, um, so the Burmese Chinte uh, was adapted and made into the Kangla Sa and it was first uh, built uh, in, um, uh, in the 1800s. And then when the Burmese occupied Kangla, uh, Kangla 4 from 1819 to uh, 1826 for seven years, they destroyed it, the two. And the succeeding king, uh, my mother's ancestor, Maharaja Narasingh, he rebuilt them in 1844. It becomes a symbol. So when the British officers after the uh, ill-fated meeting, uh, when they've actually come to arrest uh, Prince Koiring under the guise of something else, um, when they are slaughtered, their blood is smeared over the mouths of these two beasts. And so on the 20th of June uh, of, uh, of 1891, three months after the war was over and British had occupied Kangla, which is very important for them to say, we are George, we are, we are in power, they blew up. Kangla, mm. the, the two Kangla beasts, the doors. And that is, that's the one that 
uh, Sanatan B, it really gets to her because she had played at the foot of these mythical beasts as a child. This was her father's palace. This is where she grew up and it fights with Bukhoi. You know, so it was a huge thing. But even today for all money police, the 1891 loss of sovereignty is a big, you know, still sticks in the craw. Mm -hmm. And like this is when we really started losing what, what we are and who we are. And so a lot of the turmoil here, I happen to think, and I'm no political scientist, like I'm no social researcher, but I do think that a lot of it goes back to 1891. What happened? Because that was when Manipur, even though Maharaja Churachan, Binodini's father, was the king, um, it essentially became part of the British Empire. And Manipur's became a buffer state between the East India Company and Burma, because Burma is always marauding and taking people uh, uh, into slavery and so on. So it was a big, uh, powerful neighbor, militaristic, next to Manipur. So, and our orientation at the time was all about Burma. Our mm -hmm. foreign minister was called the Minister of Burmese Affairs. There was no Minister of Indian Affairs. Actually, right. Indian, a benign thing. We, there were missionaries and traders who came, but there was no military invasion from India ever. You know? So um, our fight was always with uh, the, the Central Burmese Kingdoms. So the uh, women, so Kangla is very important. That is why when, um, even though uh, Kangla was supposed to have been turned over to, to Manipur, to the state, uh, the government dragged its feet, like they dragged the feet with everything else, I suppose. But this in particular was actually uh, beginning to roil. And that's when the women, market women, disrobed and used the protest of the rape of Manorama uh, and said, Assam rifles. Yeah. Take us, exactly. rape yeah. us. You know, and it actually, that's the thing to happen in July. And by, in, by November, Manmohan Singh came and turned it over. So it's, it's still very, very symbolic of what Manipur is and what the, um, the, the identity of Manipur, the narratives of Manipur are very closely tied up with the Kamala. So to my last question now, and I hope this is uh, not, I mean, it's just a comment and hopefully leading into your uh, reading because I'm uh, looking forward to one more reading. Um, so this is again the women when they come to the residency and and uh, you know for the first time they, uh, I mean there are of course she's always being called the defiled and she's being called the native wife of the uh, the big sahab. But now all their terrible words, uh, you know, uh, come home to her as it were, and she actually suddenly understands, you know, where she is and that she is among the foreigners and these are her people and that's where she actually belongs and which is why I think she doesn't want to leave Manipur even later. But if you would read out that passage and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. that you know, uh, Sanat Zambi in various uh, points in the book, um, Binodhani notes her um, uh, ostracism, like she's not allowed to enter the palace. She has to sit outside. She would have loved to have dressed the king for the viceroy's visit, but she cannot, she cannot touch him. You know, so there are many ways in which her social distancing had been, <laughs> distancing, yeah. had been, um, um, is, is noted by Binodini, but it is the, um, the women's war against the British um, that really brought things to a head and she begins to realize that she really is not one of them. That us and them, she has to think about what she, um, you know, who she is and, and who is Maxwell. There's a scene where she walks into the meeting room and all these blue eyes turn to her and just look at her. And then without a word, they go back to the meeting and start resuming the conversation in English. You know, and she's left standing in the doorway. I mean, it is a very uh, powerful image. The portion that I want to read to you is um, the uh, when the the meeting is taking place. Maxwell is Sanatom has already told him do something about this. Do not punish my people. This is unfair. Take, take, out, take your uh, unfair order uh, away. Um, because they had burned down the British residency and then the British had said, you have to build it at your own cost. Mm. 
yeah. the princes and the Brahmins and everyone that you know had to come up and um, bring their own timber and rebuild the entire house, and this is not done. So this is the thing where Sanatombi is in her room, and Maxwell and the English officers are in the meeting in some other part of the British residency. I'll read to you the Manipuri um, original first. Maxwell na gate handok kali hai jangahala u ai unage nupi maya na residency gi sumang tam na pujilla i chokthara i chak lamsila i khom nangthara i adu phau ba hande boru saip thorpa ngairi nasi maga wa nangnagani phana khui nangai adu phau ba thorakte boru saheb chokthara ba mawa Pakraba Lupi Amana, then Katana Laurei, Sanatomi, Nang Kaidori, Nang Tora U. Hari Mayam say Nangi, Napa Naton, Natra. Saepi Pamung the Hiptana, Nama Nacha Kautopa Karigino. Amana Hai Nawado Tadora U. Nawa called the Natamliba Karigino. Tari Bara Borosai Bongi Sanatomi, Nangbu. Nama Namai Ikaitra. In English, my translation goes Maxwell had the gates opened and said, Let them in, I will see them. The women stormed towards the courtyard of the residency. They were tired, they felt hungry, their breast milk ran, but still they did not retreat as they waited for the big Sahib to come out. They would talk to him today. They, want, they waited for a fairly long time, but the big sahib still did not emerge. An exhausted woman whose husband had been arrested shouted out at the top of her lungs, Sanatombi, what are you doing? You come out. Aren't these your fathers and uncles who have been arrested? Why do you sleep in the sahib's bed, forgetting your mothers and your children? Another said, bring your husband out. Why are you holding your husband back? Are you listening, native wife of the big Sahib Sanatombi? Have you no shame? Thank you so much. This, this is the portion yeah. where the only part in the novel where Boro Sahib Omi Sanatombi, the phrase is actually mentioned. It's actually as an epithet from the monarchy. Right. That's, that's also the title of the original the title. Yeah. Original title. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sumi. That's been a fascinating conversation, really. I could have listened to so much, so much more um, about this extraordinary history and uh, of a somewhat unknown chapter also of the British Raj and definitely of, of Manipur. So thank you so much for bringing this alive for us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, El Somi Roy and Preeti Gill for such an incredible and what a warm session that was. I know I'm certainly tempted to immediately buy a copy of the book and read it. Thank you all for being a great audience. On behalf of us all, stay safe, stay double masked, and we look forward to seeing you next week on Thursday, the 22nd of July with our next session. Good night. 